Praise the Lord. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. We're continuing our series of children's Bible stories for adults. This week we're going, anybody know what's in Luke chapter 10? Twelve. Twelve. Not Zacchaeus. Well, I'm sorry, 25 through the end of the chapter. I guess there could be multiple things in chapter 10. The Good Samaritan, yeah, Luke 10. The, the Good Samaritan. While you're turning there, um, we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, MacArthur calls this the most misunderstood parable. Actually, yeah, I think he calls it the most misunderstood parable. Um, and part of why he says that, at least by his explanation, is that a lot of times this parable is co-opted by uh, ideologies uh, that have to do with um, equity, uh, social equity. There's a lot of different terms for it. Uh, there's... Uh, a lot of times the Good Samaritan is taught as uh, a, a model for being good to someone. And, and we'll certainly talk about that. And I, I don't disagree that it is a, a uh, model of, of selfless love and care. And, and we'll get there. But I think there's another idea presented. And if we're not careful, we'll miss the forest for the trees when we look at this parable. Uh, because... Jesus is ultimately answering something. So he, he uses what's called the Socratic method a lot. And all that means is, is that he answers a question with a question. So there's, there's, there's some dialogue here. Um, and I think we'd do well to follow narratively the dialogue that did happen as we consider the implications of the narrative. So let's begin um, in verse 25. And behold, the lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? Or your translation might say, How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said, this, and he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for another opportunity to gather with the body, to be edified by fellowship. Lord, I pray that you would um, quicken our minds with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that we might understand your word, that all we would do here would glorify you, that we'd be transformed into more complete pictures of what you would have us to be. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Obviously, we'll go a little further, but I, I want to... Uh, start by asking you all a question. Does anybody know what iguanas eat? Kind of. Caroline knows. What do iguanas eat, Caroline? Apples. Iguanas eat apples, and iguanas eat apples because pears give rickets. Do y'all remember me saying that? You've heard me say that before. You know what I'm referring to? So that's a mnemonic device, and it's a way in our class that we remember the uh, captivities and occupations of Israel throughout the Old Testament. So iguana is I, which would be Israel. It starts with Israel, and then E, e Egypt, apples A, B, P, G, Greek, and then R, Roman. So uh, it's Israel, then Egypt, then Assyria, Babylon, Persian, Greek, Roman. Um, the reason I bring that up is because we need to understand where Samaritans come from. It helps us understand what Jesus is really saying. Do you all remember? That, so Jesus gets called a Samaritan by Pharisees, and that wasn't a compliment. And, and as far as we understand it chronologically, he was called that after this parable was given. So it's not like they were calling back on what he said to, to compliment him. Uh, calling someone a Samaritan was not a compliment. Does anyone know where the Samaritans come from? Do you remember Caroline from Sunday? 
So it's the Assyrian captivity of the ten northern tribes. So after Egypt, Assyria uh, attacks the ten and, 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 and carries away much of the ten northern tribes of Israel. And as was practiced at that time, they essentially, as we understand it, took the best. Uh, so when we think about how Daniel winds up in Babylon, the reason Daniel and his and his uh, compadres wind up in, in, in Babylon is because they were educated, right? And they were someone of significance and someone of education. Much of the same, when Assyria conquered the ten northern tribes of Israel, they took uh, presumably the best with them and they left some behind, but so as to not allow um, them to completely uh, regrow in their original form, but to cause them to assimilate, they would then also uh, import their own citizens, and then they would move in and commingle and, and co-marry and, and, and have children with the Assyrians. So when you're talking about a Jew's perception of a, Syri of a Samaritan, you have to understand that, that they are um, half-bloods, if you will. And that's best case scenario, right? So they're uh, half, and then perhaps again another intermarriage with a Gentile, and then a couple generations later maybe another intermarriage with a Gentile. So at, at best they were half Israelites. And, and so if you know anything about how the Israelites view their lineage, uh, or the Jews view their lineage, is certainly at, at, by the time Jesus. Uh, comes incarnate, then, then you know that that would be a very big deal to them. And it was. But it's not just that. The Samaritans actually went beyond this and did some things to kind of earn their disdain. So what winds up happening is Samaritans, uh, the, these northern tribes, they're, they're cut off from, the, of course, the southern tribes, and they don't have the temple. Uh, but looking to preserve their culture as one would, they wind up making some amalgamization. Uh, well, that's what I get for, I've tripped over it too bad. They, they try to blend these, these, these belief systems into kind of one. And so you get this, the kind word would be hybrid version of Judaism, uh, where they're you know, bringing in some elements of, of perhaps paganism and bringing in some whatever the Assyrians had, some of their flavors and spices and mixing it in with Judaism. This matters. Uh, a great deal. Uh, this comes up in the New Testament when uh, the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, when she says, our father Jacob, uh, right, and built this, that's, they considered themselves to be descendants of Jacob. And not only that, but she says, when she asked Jesus the question, uh, we worship on this mountain, but you say it is better to worship in Jerusalem. What she's referring to is Mount uh, Gerizim or Gerizim, which is where they actually built their own temple. The point being that they not only were half, uh, half blood uh, Israelites, but they also kind of made some twisted version of Judaism that they followed. And there were certainly some things that were problematic about what they did. They opposed, so when you think about um, Ezra, the Ezra era, they reopposed the rebuilding of, of Jerusalem. Uh, they, they did things to to deter Israel from the Israelites from rebuilding. There's a lot of bad blood. It's about as lowly as an insult that you could give someone. There's a classic example uh, of how strongly the Jews felt about Samaritans that is typically given in the story of the, the woman at the well. There's something really odd about, well, odd, about Jesus being there in the first place. Does anybody know what I'm referring to in the story of the woman at the well? Why would it be odd that they would meet there? So the time of day is weird. She went in the heat of the day, which probably has to do with her, her, her social standing, to put it. Jews made a much longer trip out of it traveling around Samaria. Jews would not pass through Samaria. And something we talked about Sunday, and it's germane to this example, is that part of the reason they did it, it's beyond just hatred for them. Jews seemingly earnestly believed 
that they could become ceremonially, ceremonially unclean by passing through Samaria. So this is beyond, I don't like you. This is, <laughs> you're talking about people who, want, they're both saying they have the true Judaism, right, that they have followed. And one is saying, well, but we would be ceremonially unclean even to be around you. So it's a, it's a very, very strong um, hatred. And, and that, that matters a great deal as we look at this. As we look at this. So uh, let's keep going. So the lawyer stands up, says, how do I inherit eternal life? He gives a good answer. Let's continue 29. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by a chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you need, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. I really wish we had more of this exchange. Perhaps the fact that there's no more of this exchange recorded is that they've reached the conclusion of it. The lawyer had nothing else to say to him in response. That seems unlikely, but I would love to know. Um, so when we talk about a lawyer, is everybody, everybody's familiar that they mean a, a, they're, it's a, a lawyer, an expert of the law, so not someone who deals in civil torts or in criminal defense or prosecution. This would be someone, this is a religious, a religious um, someone of religious significance, someone who's educated uh, in the Old Testament law. Sometimes it's translated scribe. When we think about the parable that Jesus told, um, what we see is a couple different explanations throughout history. Uh, a couple different explanations of a couple different things. Um, some people have posited that the reason that the Levite and then the, uh, well, the priest and then the Levite would have seen him and then gone to the other side of the road, does anybody know why they might have done that if they saw a body that was, as the Bible says, left for dead? Yeah, so they would be unclean. So if this was, in fact, a dead body, you know, and we, we assume, note that we're not told, but we assume, based on the context of the story, that this is a Jew that this has happened to. But still yet, if they think the body is dead, then they could not go near it because they would be ceremonially unclean. Yes, sir? So priests had to come from the Levite tribe. If you think about the scale of the nation of, of Israel at that time, I don't, I don't know that they all, I, I could have that wrong in my head, but I, I don't know that they all were, but they, but they would come from the tribe, they would be Levites, specifically descendants of Aaron. Um, so I don't know how that worked. Uh, I think the distinction is that, um, the way I understand it is that it's in descending order of, of honor among Jews. So you have a priest, which would be the, you can maybe get away with saying, well, he can't become ceremonially unclean, and then maybe a Levite. But I also think we can understand that as descending order of, of, of the regard they would be held in. But I don't know. I've wondered that too. Um, I also wonder uh, if this does not um, mean to capture everyone in the room. Right, so if he's talking to a scribe, it may be that everyone in the room, even if they're not a priest, they're at least a Levite to be in the capacity that they're in. Now that's that's speculative, and I want to make that clear. I haven't read that in scripture, but I have wondered that. Um, I have a third theory 
that he's recounting something that really happened. <laughs> but I could, we can talk about that. We'll, we, may, we may get to that later in the lesson. But ultimately, my answer is I don't know. I don't know why. Well, kind of, but I have an idea as it relates to the, the point at the end. Okay, so this man, this Samaritan man, comes along, finds someone, left for dead, does something of great expense to himself, both his time. So two denarii, as we understand it, based on uh, archaeological evidence, does anybody know about how, how long of a stay that would be at, uh, for, for lodging at that time in history? I know. You're like, yeah, of course, I was thinking about that on the way here. It's, it's, so it's about a day's wage, and this is where I'm like, I want their economy, because when I think of a day's wage, median wage here, it does not translate to the same amount of days under someone's care. Based on what we have from archaeological evidence and historical evidence, this would have been about two months. So he went ahead and paid for two months' stay for this man. Uh, to be at the end. And then he said, it's not only that, but he says something else, and, and, and I can't remember if one of the commentaries or somebody says, you, they say, you talk about a formula for extortion. He says, and whatever else I owe you, I'll pay you when I come back. Right? So he's saying, spare no expense. Right? He says, whatever it is that you deem appropriate to, to be spent on this man, um, I will pay it when I come back. And, it, and as far as what we're told, um, within the, the, the framework of the story, he gives no limit to this, which is interesting. I think, in part, some of this is why Origen ha has one of the more famous interpretations or infamous interpretations of this parable. I'm not endorsing it. I just think it's worth discussing. Um, does, Origen, does anybody remember that name? We've talked about him before. I know who that is. He's an early, early church father. Um, you typically think of Origen and, oh goodness, I'm drawing a blank. He had, he had kind of a contemporary that he's thought of with. Anyways, Origen is like, you're talking like first, within the first five generations, ten generations of the church early, early church father. Origen looked at this story, and, and, or this parable, and what he saw was, so you have this, the man in the ditch, right? And being left for dead, he equates that with our condition in sin, right? So when you think about, uh, especially on the authority of the New Testament, the wages of sin is death, right? And so, apart from literally divine intervention, that, um, that this, we would be, we ourselves are left for dead in sin, or even called dead in sin, right, by the New Testament. So, so he looks at man, and he says, okay, well, that clearly represents, that's us in sin, okay? So, who, so, he has, there's some different ideas about who the people who come along are, but we'll skip to the next important one for the sake of time. Who do you think he supposes the Samaritan was? Who do you think? It's not blasphemous, because you won't mean it that way. We're just discussing someone's idea, which kind of gives away who it is. It's Jesus. So Origen thinks that the Samaritan is Jesus. So here's an interesting one. It says he puts it on his animal. Does anybody know what Origen thought that was? He thought that was Christ's body. Okay. The deposit at the end. What did he think that was, you think? Any guesses? He thought that was the Holy Spirit. Right? So, as Jesus goes away, he leaves something to the benefit of the man and his condition, which is the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, 
The man returning is what? That's the second coming of Christ by Origen's estimation. And the reason I wanted to share this with you, despite the fact that I don't endorse it as an understanding, is because I think it really captures the difficulty of trying to nail down, as some do, the exact meaning of the parable. Because I think there are two things at play. I think that there is perhaps a meaning of the parable, but I think there is a point of the parable that we can more readily understand. Um, there are certainly some merits to this, I think, right? I mean, when we think about... The, every, so when we flip it and understand that everything good that a human does is just a tiny, tiny piece, not, not in like a, a you know, Hindu Krishna sense, but a tiny, tiny piece of, of reflecting on the character of God, right? So anything good done, any charity really is, is only a reflection of the light that God shines in his perfect character. So when we think about what the Samaritan does for the man, it, it's not so far-fetched. And there are certainly some elements of the gospel there, right? The man, in his condition, can do nothing for himself. He's left for dead. We don't, he may not even be conscious at this point. We don't know. But all understanding of, and translating of this phrase is that he's going to die unless someone does something. So the Samaritan comes upon him uh, through his own means, saves the man, right? Uh, the Christ body offered, um, gives us the Holy Spirit to guard us in our wellness while, he, and to, while we wait for his return, so our time here on earth, and then he's returning. I don't think that it doesn't have merit, I just think that it's getting in the weeds, but I, I want to share it with you because I, I really want to drive home the point that what you will hear a lot of people work really hard to explain the meaning of the parable itself. And I think when, they, when we do that, we miss the point. Now, I think Origen was at least closer than what a lot of people do because a lot of people do, what a lot of people do with this parable is they use it as an example of why we should seek total equitable, equitable outcome here on earth, right? Redistribution of wealth, um, not owning anything, right? Communal living, all these things, a lot of kind of, you know, liberal ideologies, and I, I don't mean just liberal in the confines of our political system, I mean broader than that, but a lot of things, a, a lot of these institutions co-op this parable to try to build some biblical justification and say, well, see, this is what Jesus taught. Again, in the context of what's happening here, I, I really think we can miss the forest for the trees if we focus too much on the, the nuance of, of what's happening. I think the better understanding um, is to go back and remember why Jesus is telling this in the first place. And we can know that, right? So let's go back to the beginning here in 25. He says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. So we know his intention. Saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is amazing to me. Because when we think about Nicodemus, I know this was a, while, a couple weeks ago, but when we think about Nicodemus, when we talked about Nicodemus, I think what we see here among two uh, religious scholars, two Jews, two uh, regarded Jews between this, this lawyer, this scribe, and, and Nicodemus, is they do something very similar, but they kind of do the inverse of what the other does. So Nicodemus comes, maybe wanting, uh, certainly by, indicated by Christ's response, as we discuss, wanting to know what he has to do to in, in, inherit eternal life. But what does he ask Jesus? He doesn't actually ask anything. What does he say? So before that, even before that, when he first comes, the first dialogue we see, the first thing Nicodemus says is, I, I, think, you're a prof I think you're from God, right? So, so how is it that you could do these signs if you're not from God, right? He doesn't actually say anything about eternal life. And then Jesus says to that, he says, no one will enter the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. So Jesus knows what he's really wanting, but he's not admitting, right? And then answers it. This man does the opposite. He says, 
as it says, putting him to the test, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So he asked the right question, right? Because that's the question we should be asking. For, well, for the saints, we have asked that and found our answer. But if you're, if you're not, then, then, then you should be asking, what, should I, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And then we see the Socratic method. He says, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answers well. He answers so well. I believe it's, what is it, Matthew 22, 23, where uh, Jesus says this. He gives this as an answer. Uh, this is, and this is from Deuteronomy chapter 5, I believe. He says, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And, and the reason there's a fourth there that's not necessarily there in Deuteronomy, we can talk about that later if you want. Take some time. You've got to have two hours to do it. And, then, and your neighbor as yourself. So this, again, is the opposite of what happens with Nicodemus. Because Nicodemus uh, doesn't ask his question. And when he gets his question answered, he doesn't understand, or at least does not want to, does not want to accept or lead on, that he understands the answer to his question or accepts it. This man, not really asking asks the question, gets the heart of it answered by a question, and then thinks he has the answer. And he's not even wrong, right? Because what does Jesus say? Jesus says in verse 28, And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Well, isn't that interesting? Jesus says, Yeah. Yeah, spot on. I think you've got it right. And what does Jesus say? He says, So do that. Should be satisfactory, right? I mean, the guy says, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, yeah, just do that. You're good. Just do that. The man wasn't satisfied. 29 continues, but he desired to justify himself. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I think... The verse we most need to consider in this passage to understand what Jesus is teaching is verse 29. But he, desiring to justify himself. Rewind the tape a little bit. What is Jesus answering a question about? Not a trick question. I know I stuttered through the question, but it's not a trick question. What, what, what question was he asked? And how does he answer? Because he does ask a question, but what does he point the man to in his answer? But, but more broadly than that, what does he say, before the man answers him, how does he prompt him? What does he send the scribe back to to get his answer? The the law. He sends him to the law. How do you inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, what does the law say? The man answers. He summarizes the law well, right? And that is a good summary of the law because when we look at, for example, the Ten Commandments, about half of them have to do with our relationship with God and half of them have to do with our relationship with man, either other man or ourself, right? And so, so he's summarized the law well in what he said and Jesus says, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And I don't know that I would have even put this together if I didn't have the help of verse 29. But what the man has now in effect done for himself has set his own trap because Jesus affirms this, and the man, either sarcastically, because he really thinks he's got there, I don't know which is worse, that, or the idea that he thinks that he's really this close and he just needs to clarify one more thing. <clears throat> but it says, looking to justify himself. So in other words, when we consider the question asked, which is eternal life, and the answer given, which is, what does the law say? The man looks at this and he goes, hmm, okay, here's one thing left for me to nail down. In other words, in essence, this man was trying to justify himself by 
What? The law. The law. What does Paul tell us about the law? Paul tells us the law only condemns. There's no justification in the law, but the law only condemns. And this man is coming to Jesus, supposedly seeking eternal life. What must I do? He summarizes this as the law. Jesus says, yep, keep the law. Just do that. And the man, instead of doing... And here's another difference when we compare the two, when we think about what Nicodemus said to Jesus, and we think about what this man said to Jesus. Nicodemus, in essence, says, who can be saved? Right? He's, because Jesus says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus goes, he says, would a man enter a second time into his mother's womb? He, the, the essence of that, of that statement is, well then, who will be saved? Right? No one's going to be saved because if we have to do that, we can't do that. This man, instead of having that response of being presented to how we receive eternal life, says, oh, so just to make sure I get this right, who's my neighbor? What he's implying in his answer is that he is already loving God this way. What he's implying in his answer and his follow-up question is that I've got everything else right according to the law, and all I need to do is make sure I've got this last thing right, and then I'll be good and I can know I have eternal life. What's the, what's the issue with that? Not only that, he's dead wrong. He cannot measure up to the law. He is grossly misunderstanding himself or the law or both when he thinks that he is this close to being justified by the law. The word you use is perfect. It's self-righteousness, right? So he wanting to be righteous in the law, but where he's deriving this from is self in a very literal sense. And I think self-righteousness is a perfect phrase because I think that's exactly what Jesus is dealing with in this parable. And the reason I wanted to spend some time talking about who the Samaritans were and what Jews thought about them is I wanted us to have that backdrop to understand that Jews hated Samaritans. They did. They hated them. And not only did they hate them, they used a psalm to justify it when David said that, that you're in it, those who hate you, I hate those who hate you, your enemies have become my enemies. Jews looked at that and said, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, they're not my neighbor. I hate them. And I'm allowed to hate them because of this psalm. They hated Samaritans. Hated them. And this man has the audacity as not only a Jew, but a scribe, someone of education in the law, someone who was presumably devout. And in order to be devout in, in this culture, and I say culture, not religion on purpose, in this culture, uh, he had to hate Samaritans because that's what they did. He's told this, and he goes, yeah, yeah, I've got that. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm there. I'm almost there. And some, some teachers translate this or interpret his answer as being sarcastic. Some of them understand him to, to being tongue-in-cheek when he even asks, as if it's assumed the answer. Well, who is my neighbor? Well, of course, other Jews are. You know, people I like. And not even, not, not all Jews, but just the Jews that I get along with. And, well, I don't get along with them all the time, but, you know, I don't have to, you know, get it just right. Well, no, that's not what Jesus said. He if you're going to use the law to justify yourself, you have to follow the law perfectly. That's why there's no justification in the law, only condemnation, because exactly how many people have ever followed the law perfectly? It's a trick question. It's not zero. One. <laughs> I, zero is my first answer in my head, too. I was like, none! Well, well, one, right? Jesus, right? It's the Sunday school answer. This man is so self-righteous when confronted with the law. Now, remember Paul, right, the Jew's Jew, right, well advanced beyond his contemporaries and his study and his devotion, he says that the law showed him his sin, right, that the law crushed him. That's his take on the law. And this man, supposedly seeking eternal life, thinks he's good. Again, when we consider this as the backdrop of this parable. I think there's a lot of perhaps even profitable and good 
dialogue about this, <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> but at the end of the day, this is not at all, I, well, I shouldn't say not at all. I think that we can miss something really important if we get hung up in this. And that is, when confronted with an example, and here's why I said that I think maybe Jesus was recounting something that really happened. Could we have to time out here? This is not, what I'm about to say is not in the Bible. I'm not telling you it's in the Bible. I'm not even teaching it as absolute, not even close. I'm just going to tell you something that I think won't, it would not surprise me to find this out to be true when I get to heaven. Okay? And the same thing about, you know, I, I estimate what the, the, the animal that was killed in the garden, the first uh, blood atonement for sin, right, when they, when they were clothed by God because they tried to clothe themselves with, with, with leaves and then God clothed them with an animal skin. You know what I think that animal was? I think it was a lamb, right? I don't know, but I won't be surprised if I get to find out someday that it was a lamb. Makes a lot of sense to me as far as imagery is concerned. I would not be surprised to find out one day that the story Jesus is telling is a story that the man in question had some role in. I think there's a way to understand him being either the Levite that passed by the man or being the man in the ditch. But either way, it would not surprise me in the slightest to find that out. Even if that's not the case, the potency of the point remains. This man is quite sure that a Samaritan does not count as his neighbor. In the course of a parable that took 30 seconds to tell, two minutes if he used a lot of pause and inflection, I mean, how long could it have taken? His entire conviction crumbles that quickly. Because what does he admit? Who is his neighbor? The one who had mercy on him. Who had mercy on the man? The Samaritan. So these people that he hates, right, and, and as a lot of translators understand it, he sarcastically asked, assuming Samaritans, among others, are not his neighbor, now he's ready to admit they're a neighbor. I personally am convicted that a way we understand what Jesus is teaching, although the parable is part of the instrument of his teaching, is what's going on around the parable. Jesus is helping this man understand, and this is instructional. Jesus is using the law to help this, under, this man understand what? Exactly. Exactly. He doesn't love his neighbor. And if he doesn't love his neighbor like he thought he did, maybe he doesn't love God with all his heart. If he doesn't love God with all his heart, maybe he doesn't love him with all his soul. If he doesn't love him with all his heart and soul, maybe he doesn't love him with all his strength. If he doesn't love him with all of that, maybe not even his mind either. Jesus is destroying this man's self-righteousness obliterating it in a matter of minutes. Is that cruel of Jesus? Well, of course not. But why isn't it? <laughs> this man cannot inherit eternal life until he understands this. You're exactly right. Now, when I say understand, I don't mean understand the depths of it, but I do mean understand that he cannot be justified by the law. And why can't he be justified by the law? He doesn't keep it. He doesn't keep it. There is no room for any varying or wandering or miss or mess up that if you are guilty you are guilty and we know the wage of that sin this man cannot inherit eternal life 
unless he perfectly keeps the law. Now, notice, Jesus does not say you can't be made righteous by the law. He does say, well, if you want eternal life, right, keep the law. Why can he say that? Why is that not untrue of Jesus to say? He did. <laughs> he did keep the law. We have, a, we have a phrase we use when we talk about us getting into heaven. So has everybody, anybody ever thought about the fact that, that no imperfection is not allowed in heaven? And have you ever thought about how that's pretty tough because we're all imperfect? So the question becomes, how on earth do we get to reside? And let's just, let's say even in the presence of God. Anybody, you've heard this phrase before? Anybody know what this is? Imputed righteousness. This is Christ's righteousness imputed to us. So how can we be justified by the law? Well, in ourselves, there is absolutely no way. But Christ kept the law. He both kept it and was the law giver. Well, there's a thought. And freely offering up himself affords us the opportunity to be made righteous in and through and by him. What do I think the point of this parable is? I think the point of this parable is, is that you cannot justify yourself by the law. Every time Jesus deals with someone, when we think about Nicodemus, when we think about the Samaritan woman at the well, when we think about the scribe, he, he, whether we realize it at first blush or not, he, he gets to the heart, literally, of the issue. And for this man, it would seem, the heart of the issue is that he would want to be justified by the law. It's a common plight for the Jews. And Jesus, in essence, says, with one example, I can prove to you, you don't keep the law. So how are you going to be justified now? Where is your eternal life now? That's in part why I would love to hear the rest of the conversation. Does Jesus leave it at this? Does Jesus clarify like he does to the Samaritan woman that the person... Right, so she says that she knows that the Messiah is coming and Christ says, I'm him. You know, what did the rest of that conversation look like? I don't know. It's not for us to know. It's not written down. But what I hope we all understand from this parable, and I'm not discouraging you, let me be clear, I'm not discouraging you from working to, to understand the, the implications of the, of the parable within itself. That's, you know, I think that there are uh, Christ characteristics in the Samaritan. Jesus is called a Samaritan later. Uh, there's some interesting parallels. I don't think Origen was stupid, right? And so there's, you know, the idea that, that Jesus, when we know, we know Jesus' lineage, is it, is it purely Jewish? No, right? Right? So, I mean, there's not, it's not so far-fetched, but I just don't think that's the point for us to understand. I think the point for us to understand is we cannot and will not be justified in ourselves by the law. We don't keep the law. And the better understanding is, is that we don't keep any of the law. You know, it's not that, like, like we might suggest that we've got one thing nailed down. No, you don't. We don't keep any of it. We would do well to keep a posture of humility, brokenness, and thankfulness. The weight of the law is immense, and it will crush everyone who has not been made righteous in Christ. Questions, comments, concerns, or snide remarks? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to legally work out how they can, they can make it work for them. It's instructional. It's instructional for how we understand evangelism. You, you, I, as far as I can tell, in any example Jesus gives us, any example any of the epistles give us, you cannot tell the gospel 
without dealing with sin. Just can't. It's not the full gospel. I've always, I'm, you've probably heard it this way too growing up in church, that there is no good news unless there is bad news first, right? So we always, you know, here's the good news. Well, you, well there are, there, here's some bad news, but here's the good news, right? So there, there's, no, there's no presentation of the gospel that doesn't, that's complete that doesn't deal with sin. And, I, and that's modeled in Christ's ministry. It's modeled in the apostles. I, I believe it's clear from Scripture. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a pastor who we were talking about this this week and and I, I love uh, as I often do I really appreciate what it means for him and not that we don't enjoy discussing and, and considering things but but he, he said as we were kind of summarizing our thoughts on the matter he said I'm thankful I'm thankful that someone came to me in my broken state, with no ability to help myself, right, left for dead, and out of, out of grace and mercy, uh, at expense to themselves, uh, made me whole again. So whether origin's right or not, there is a picture of the character of Christ in this that we all should be thankful. We were left for dead in a ditch. And, if you want to bring it full circle... <laughs> We were left for dead in a ditch by the law, right? It, it, it condemns us completely to death. But Christ, in his goodness, in his mercy, in his grace, came that he might make us whole. Amen. Amen. Surely y'all have something to rib me with. Y'all are letting me off easy. Praise the Lord. May we all be grateful. Of course, this is, an, this is what a wonderful backdrop as we consider the advent of Christ. Don't forget gifts. Don't forget the frankincense. Johnny shared with me um, earlier. Will you write them down? 